13. All right, yeah, verses 44 through 50. Okay, I'll begin. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sell, sells all that he has and buys that field. Amen. Who, on finding one, great, one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. And throw them into the fire furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. All right, now Pastor William will give the message. Hey, good morning, everyone. All right, the title. Oh, by the way, I, I don't know uh, it, even if an angel came down, if we could have had a better invitation to the ISBC than what we just heard. I, I, <laughs> you know, that was a very joyful uh, invitation, and I think, uh, I think we all could feel that. The uh, title of this morning's message is simply Treasure. Does everyone like treasure? Yeah. Does everyone want to be rich? Yeah. Yes. Today's passage tells us about treasure, and it tells us about how to be rich. It comes from Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 to 50, and the key verse is 44. Let's read this together. Okay, let's go. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Amen. So last week, uh, if you remember, we studied uh, the wheat and weeds parable explained. It was not a new parable. It was one that we had already covered, but we read and studied Jesus' explanation. So far in the book of Matthew, chapter 13, we've covered now four parables Four parables, and in today's passage, how many parables are we going to add to our treasure of parables? Three, that's right. Three more parables and one message and one passage. Through today's um, three parables, we're going to learn a very, uh, the answer to a very important question. I'm not trying to be hyperbolic here, but what is mankind's biggest mistake? We're going to learn the answer to this question. What is mankind's biggest mistake? It might not be evident to all of us, um, but from today's passage, it should be crystal clear to all of us. What is mankind's biggest mistake? Before we begin, let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you so much for blessing us with Jesus who came to this world uh, humble and as a... Um, Savior, to teach us the way to the kingdom of heaven through his teaching, through his life, through his deeds, and most importantly, through his sacrifice on the cross. And you raised him again through the power of, uh, through the power of your resurrection to give us hope in a future glory in heaven. Lord, we pray that today's uh, passage would really speak to our hearts. May you minister to us and show us uh, the true spiritual reality. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's begin by looking at verses 44 to 46. Let's read these verses responsibly. I'll go first. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. So he, we see here these, uh, the first two parables are somewhat similar in their structure and probably in their message. The, but let's look at the, uh, the first uh, parable and, and let's take notice that this first parable deals with somebody 
who comes across treasure hidden in a field. And it, obviously it's buried, and he finds it, and then he covers it up. And then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. One question might come to us is, why is there treasure buried in a field? You know, you go out and uh, play soccer or go to the monkey bars at the park. The likelihood that you're going to find treasure buried uh, in the park, for example, is very unlikely. However, if you really kind of do a search, an internet search, or just like look at a survey of all the times people found treasure buried in random spots, it's actually pretty surprising how often it happens. For example, I want to tell you a little story about uh, something called the Saddle Ridge Treasure, SRT, Saddle Ridge Treasure. This is a story, it's a real story, it happened back in 2013. There was a couple who liked to walk on their property. Uh, they'd take walks and you know, strolls, and especially they'd like to walk their dog. And they had a very interesting experience. They, they spent years and years walking on this property and uh, you know, taking their dog for a stroll. And they, they found this one day, they found this can that was oddly like fused into a tree. Like somebody had tied a can there a long time ago to that tree and then over time the tree grew and then grew around the can and there was like a can. And there was another odd landmark in their, on their property which was this, um, this rock that looked kind of like a saddle. It was shaped like a saddle, like thick at the top and then tapered down. So one day they were walking along, you know, and, and minding their own business and they saw a can that was sticking out of the earth. And so, you know, it's a pretty good can, good sized can, about the size of a coffee can. And so they just kind of like unearthed it a little bit because it was already popping out. And then they just started walking home. It was sealed and it was closed up. They thought when they get home, they might, uh, you know, crack it open and see what's inside. They actually thought maybe it had lead paint in it, right? <laughs> so they're a little bit cautious. But as they were walking back, all of a sudden this can popped open and lo and behold, what was inside? Tons of gold coins. And this was very surprising to them. They didn't actually know what to do uh, with this treasure that they had unearthed. But they thought to themselves, well, what ha maybe there's more there, right? So the value was obviously there, but had they really f dug around uh, all the way? I don't, they, they knew that they hadn't. So they got a metal detector, went back, and they actually unearthed seven more canisters all with more gold coins in them. And these gold coins were not in the, uh, the best of shape, but for the most part, they were actually really uh, in good condition because they had not been circulated and passed around and used actually as currency. So these gold coins, they, they, um, they took them to a, a expert, uh, and it turns out that they had uh, found not one, not two, not a hundred, but 1,400 gold coins that in total was worth $10 million. It was buried treasure. What in the world was this amount of treasure doing buried? Well, in modern times, in 2023, if you have a bunch of money, you take it to the bank. But many times throughout history, especially in Jesus' time, the way to secure valuable treasure was to actually bury it in the ground. And also it was the common uh, you know, uh, practice, even when banks were around, that people, like the, um, the rich guy who owned this uh, plot of land, it's evident that he didn't trust banks. And so he buried his gold in the ground, but then maybe something happened to him and nobody knew that it was there. So in verse 44, although it may seem like an odd scenario or circumstance, it actually was very common for people to bury treasure in their field and maybe mark it with some kind of object or bury it under a, a tree of some kind of landmark. So. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. 
Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Now, it's obvious from this uh, parable that the field, the cost of buying the field, was not equal to the treasure that was in it. In fact, to buy this field was a great deal of the century. To buy this field was such an awesome deal. It was, it was uh, better than uh, shopping at the 99 cent store and get, getting your, finding your favorite deal there. This was truly a remarkable deal for this man who found this hidden treasure. So in his joy, he went and sold and bought that field. It's important to note that he didn't take out the treasure there on the spot. He went the very formal, correct, legal way and bought the field and then you know, had the treasure that way instead of stealing it. You know, likewise, the, um, the people that I mentioned um, with this, the Saddle Ridge treasure, they could, because they owned the property, when they found the treasure, it was belonging to them. But let's look at verse 45 and 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, just one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Like many messages, I end up doing deep dives on topics that I knew nothing about. And uh, I got to tell you, I now know more about pearls <laughs> than, than I ever need to know. Um, pearls, according to um, you know, the, the, the statistics, uh, you know, these days pearls are not made naturally anymore. They're actually made like artificially, but they're still made inside of oysters and clams and other kinds of um, uh, uh, clam-like um, uh, sea animals, but in these days, pearls were very hard to find. You couldn't make them like you can nowadays. You, can't mass, you didn't mass produce them. The knowledge wasn't there. So actually, to find a pearl, naturally, is about one in 12,000. Uh, about one in 12,000. So you have to crack open 12,000 uh, clams or oysters before you find just one pearl. So because of the rarity, pearls were very, very uh, scarce and precious. So this merchant, he's a very um, acquainted with assessing value and understanding markets and trade. And so in his uh, job as a merchant, he was in search of fine pearls. However, Seemingly unexpectedly, he found one pearl, the mother of all pearls, of great value. It was like unlike any other pearl, and he had seen many, many pearls in his life. But this one stood out. It was different. It was on a whole nother level than every other pearl that he'd ever seen before. And as a result, he knew its value because he was an expert in assessing the value of pearls. You know, one of the things about, um, you know, uh, becoming a, a, a homeowner is there's the, these, these guys that come to your house called appraisers. And an appraiser is somebody who comes to your house and looks around and judges your house and takes a bunch of notes and then in the end they say your house based on the market value is worth this much money and you're always crossing your fingers you're hoping to god god please say that the value is very high because the appraiser you know some some are very uh, generous other ones are very tight but appraisers all they do is just look at homes and assess value and this merchant was very much like that he was an expert in understanding and perceiving value. So how did this uh, merchant find his amazing pearl? Well, when we look at the uh, passage, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. He was in search of it. He was looking for it. He was really spending his time, energy, effort, looking for pearls and he just happened to come across 
one that was really beyond his expectations. So what is the commonality of these parables? How are, now, obviously, they are a little bit different, but they obviously have one or two or maybe even three common things that they're exactly the same in. And side note, we have to ask ourselves the question, why would Jesus give two parables that kind of have somewhat of a common point to them? I think it's because Jesus wanted to double underline the commonalities, but yet highlight the nuanced differences. So let's pay attention, first of all, to the commonalities of these parables. What is the common theme of these parables? Um, does anybody want to uh, answer that question? Did, what? Finding. Finding something? Oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> amazing. Finding amazing treasure. <laughs> Thank you. It's a great answer. Yes, the, co the commonality is this idea of finding amazing treasure. Now, you think that the, the merchant, he was looking for pearls, right? But even in his case, he found something that was clearly beyond his expectation. He found amazing treasure. And the, and the man who found the treasure buried in the field found amazing treasure. Finding an amazing treasure is actually what everybody wants in their life. You know, we have two, two types of treasure. We have passive longing treasure, things that we daydream about. Treasure, like when you, you know, kind of are uh, sitting in, in a line, you might dream about some kind of treasure. And then there's also active seeking treasure, treasure that we're actively looking for, that we're pursuing, spending our time on. Everyone wants to find amazing treasure. There's not a single person in this room who doesn't want to find amazing treasure. You've heard of the expression though, one's man, one man's trash is another man's what? Treasure. Treasure can look different to different people. So what form does our treasure take? Well, I think there's, oftentimes it takes the shape of four types of treasure. Let's think about this for a second. The first type of treasure that is common among us, common amongst all people across all time, is security. Security. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. That's Nelson. If you haven't met Nelson, <laughs> say hi to Nelson. And that's Michael there too. Michael, Michael and Nelson, they're, they're, they're uh, two buddies of mine, new friends. So security, let's think about security. Some people long to establish security and safety, eliminating all feelings of anxiety and vulnerability. So they work hard to think through all the possible moves, options, and to strategize a path forward into a stable, protected life. Treasure in the form of stability and security. However, oftentimes, even the most secure people find that their treasure, their security in this world is shaken completely and it falls apart. Security in this life is a treasure that is sometimes found but is oftentimes removed. What about love? Love is another treasure that many people are looking for. Some people desire to be loved and to show love, to really make a genuine connection with another person, just one person. I want to have a love connection with. So they uh, find, they actively seek out their treasure in the form of a sweetheart. However, you know what sweethearts are good for sometimes? 
is creating a broken heart. And anyone who pursues the treasure of love will learn very quickly the corruption and reality of sinful man. Their treasure of love oftentimes never truly being found in another person. But what about the a third one, wealth? Some people desire to build something with their life, something big and valuable and lasting, something that they could even grow over time, like an empire. But it doesn't have to be a big empire, just like a little empire. Something that you could put your name on, water it, watch it grow. However, like everything, empires and growing wealth, they have life cycles of boom and bust. And so many people have tried to find the treasure of wealth, but have simply lost their treasure completely. The decay of this world cannot be reckoned with. Everything is perishing. Everything is decaying, including wealth. Lastly, recognition. Some people have longed passively or actively seeking it for a name for themselves, to do something worth being recognized above and beyond others, to become special, unique, and important. However, it's wearisome to stay at the top. And just when you think that you've reach the pinnacle, the competitors are biting at your feet, looking to knock you down. Truly, the uh, podium of excellence is a treasure that is short-lived. So all these ways, mankind is actively and sometimes passively trying to secure treasure. In the quietness of your spirit, which one do you find yourself drawn to? Is it one of these four or is it something different? We should know what our treasure, our inclination toward, what kind of treasure we're inclined towards. We need to know ourselves. Because... Back to the question, what is mankind's biggest mistake? Jesus taught us that man's biggest mistake we can make is looking for treasure on earth instead of in heaven. Let me show that again. What is mankind's biggest mistake? Let's say it together. Looking for treasure on earth instead of in heaven. There is no treasure on earth. There is no treasure on earth. All treasure, all of it, is in heaven. All treasure is in heaven above and not on the earth below. This is a very critical thing that Jesus came all the way from heaven to earth to teach us, to save us from the perishing life of pursuing treasure on earth that is no treasure whatsoever. We saw this in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. Do not lay up for yourself treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. He also showed us this um, in uh, another place in Matthew chapter 6 when he said, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Even our Christian lives, the good deeds that we do in the name of the Lord can be done for human recognition on earth. 
So Jesus warns us in Matthew 6, beware of that trap. Beware of trying to store up treasure on earth in the form of recognition. Because the true treasure is the reward that comes from our Father in heaven. So this is the, probably the most important thing I'll say through this message. All treasure is in heaven above and not on the earth below. Amen. You know, I think there's uh, two types of people. And sometimes we can be one or the other. Like, this isn't like a binary thing, but it's to think about it. We can be like the person, one, who your whole life, trying to seek treasure, doing this and that, trying to work your way to get that treasure on earth, only to find yourself empty-handed, never getting it. And then there's other people who similarly seek after treasure on earth, and they do get it. Sometimes they say, I was just lucky. (laughs) I think that's true in a sense. But after getting their treasure on earth, They came to find that that treasure that they sacrificed years and countless hours, relationships, and had prioritized was actually just sand, just dirt of no value after working so hard to attain it. We can be like one, we can be like two, we can be a mixture, but regardless, Jesus says to us, Jesus says to anyone whose hands are empty or people's hands are full of sand, to these people, Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30, come to me. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So there remains one question from these uh, first two parables. How can we get this treasure that's in heaven? Maybe you're saying, okay, I'm persuaded. There's no treasure on earth. I kind of think so too. But how can I get this treasure that's in heaven? Let's look back at the passage. Let's look at the second commonality. And this one's a big commonality. If you look at the last... um, expression in both of these parables we see in the first one jesus says then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field and then in the merchant parable he says who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it we see here in both these parables that jesus encourages us, directs us, shows us the way to get the real treasure, the only treasure, which is in heaven, is to go and sell our life, to buy that treasure that's in heaven. I have a, a, a name I want to float by everyone. I'm, uh, I'm going to do a little uh, research, marketing research here. I want to call this uh, Jesus' Heavenly Trading Program. <laughs> Jesus' Heavenly Trading Program. Just look at this. What is, the, what is one of the essences of this? Is that there was this thing of great value. And the way that they could have it was to take what they already had and sell it. That thing that they already had was of way less value than this great thing that they had found. 
It was like a trading upgrade all in one. It was a heavenly trading program where you get far more out of what you put in. It's a steal. It's a deal. I, I'm apprehensive to use the word steal. <laughs> you know what I mean. It's a deal. It's the, it's the deal of all deals. You know, back uh, in the early 2000s, I think it was, there was this, um, there was this uh, commercial. Uh, you guys, does anyone recognize this? This was, this was, a, this was a, a commercial series called I'm a Mac and I'm a PC. And basically what this was is, uh, you know, back in this time, you know, barely anybody used Macs. You know, uh, sometimes Troy and I, we, we uh, needle each other because uh, Troy likes uh, uh, Windows PCs and I like Macs. And uh, this commercial would try to persuade PC people to get a Mac, to trade in even their PC to get the uh, far superior Macintosh platform. <laughs> Some of you saw what I did there. But the point is, is that there's many things in life where we can trade like a merchant and get something that's better, seemingly. But this is God's heavenly trading program. You know, our life here on earth, we can spend our time trying to secure treasure on here on earth. Or we can trade that in, our time, our heart, our priorities, our mind, everything, who we are. Trade it in for treasure in heaven. This is what Jesus came to show us the way to. He came all the way from heaven to reveal this way to us, that we can lose our life and thereby find our life. So this is God's heavenly trade-in program, and it is really the essence of the kingdom of heaven, because the kingdom of heaven, as we see in, in these two parables, Jesus gave two similar parables. And to me, it's pretty clear he wanted to really punctuate this point because if we lose our life, we'll find it. But if we find our life, we lose it. Let's look at verses 47 to 50, though. Let's look at um, these verses and read them responsibly. Okay, this is the third parable now. Okay. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous. So here Jesus begins this third parable in our passage today. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. Lots and lots of different fish this net caught. This net caught indiscriminately. It didn't like, you know, nets can't say, oh, I want this one, I want that one. You know, nets just catch fish, all kinds of fish. And so Jesus says here, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. This kind of reminds us of the parable of the sower, where the sower goes out and indiscriminately throws out seed into the field, and it lands on all kinds of different types of soil. Likewise, this net is catching all types of fish, of every kind, it even says. And when it was full, when it was all, no, no more fish to catch, men drew to shore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. Maybe back into the sea, I don't know. And then now verse 49, Jesus gives us the explanation 
uh, it's kind of nice when Jesus gives the parable and then he gives the, the explanation right after it. So he says, so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We saw that expression last week, weeping and gnashing of teeth. So I think that this uh, parable, I, there's, a, there's a lot that could be asked about this parable. But I want to focus on just one question. I think it's maybe the question uh, that many people might have. How is a good fish and a bad fish determined? You know, Jesus shows us that at the end of the age, this net, which we can call the church or the gospel or the kingdom of heaven, it's caught up all kinds of people. Just imagine all the people here that, that Jesus caught in his net. And think about across all the hundreds and hundreds, even thousands of years that this net has been catching people. The kingdom of heaven has been grabbing people and they've come into the kingdom of heaven on earth. But then the, the, at the end, there's going to be a separation of good fish and bad fish, as he mentions here. So how is a good fish and a bad fish determined? I think that there's um, a real simple answer. And it's actually found in, uh, in other places of Matthew's gospel that are just like this. It's actually pretty shocking. Do you remember back when we studied the Sermon on the Mount, how the Sermon on the Mount ended with two men, or, or two builders rather? And then Jesus said, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And then Jesus mentioned also another person who, who heard these words of his, but did not do them. And he was like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And then later on, we're going to see a third, uh, another very similar parable about sheep and goats. And in this parable, at the end of Matthew, Jesus says here, for I was hungry. He, and, and how he determines the sheep from the goats, he says here, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. The determination between the sheep and the goats is not based on credentials or experience or biblical knowledge, but simply about who did what they were supposed to do in the Lord. Who practiced Jesus' teaching was the determining factor between the sheep and the goats. So when we look at all three of these examples, we see that Jesus, in talking about the end, separates those who put into practice his words from those who don't. Likewise, this seems to be the determining factor between the good fish and the bad fish simply hearing his words and doing what it says. So in conclusion, today we learned that, uh, we learned about hidden treasure. We learned about the nature of treasure, that in ourselves that we can have strong desires for treasure here on earth. However, there is no treasure here on earth. All treasure is found in heaven. We learned that our precious Lord Jesus came all the way from heaven to save us from this direction, this meaningless direction of trying to store up treasure on earth, which is just going to fade away. Whether we have an empty hand or whether we have a handful of sand, Jesus really encourages us to start living and practicing his way so that we can have true treasure in heaven. We also learned that in order to get this treasure, we need to give our life to the gospel, to Jesus, to do the will of our Heavenly Father. And by doing so, we'll have a great reward in heaven and eternal glory forevermore. So let's read the key verse, uh, verse 44. Okay, let's go. 
The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. One word, treasure. Let's pray. Father in heaven, um, thank you so much for blessing us with Jesus' words to um, really uh, uh, seek after the treasure uh, that's in heaven. Um, thank you so much for this parable uh, to show that the, uh, the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who uh, go and sell everything that they have to buy this true treasure that's in heaven. Uh, Lord, this treasure is not found on earth, but yet we can use our life on earth to find it and to have it. Uh, we pray for your anointing upon us that we might really live um, for this treasure, uh, not for the earthly one. We thank you for this time. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.